friends, welcome to this Bandava celebration. I am very happy that you have all come to join me in celebrating the day of abundance. Bandhara is the Hindi word, Indian word, that means celebration of Bandhar. Bandhar means abundance. Every year on the 2nd of April, I come here and we celebrate this day because the abundance that we notice on this day, I have never noticed anywhere else on any other day. Why is that? That's because the great master's grace, whose Bandhara we are celebrating, is so abundant on the 2nd of April each year that I mark it in my calendar. And that's the day if I want to share the best wealth I have with every one of my friends, I should invite them to come on the 2nd of April. That's why I congratulate all of you, all my friends, some new, most of them old friends. Some who look like new friends are also old friends, you'll find out. <laughs> I'm very happy that you have come to celebrate this uh, special occasion tomorrow. Tomorrow is 2nd of April and we'll have abundance of grace. A lot of people used to think that Bandara is abundance of food and they made good food. When I first came to this country and attended a few satsangs, they said, that was a great Bandara. I said, really? Food was excellent. So the emphasis was on food. The truth is, that's the abundance of grace that flows. Grace flows all the time. There is never an occasion when a master's grace is not flowing for his disciples. But on a day like that, when we are anticipating that grace, when we are looking forward to that grace, the grace has more effect. It is like a cup that is receiving water in a rainfall. If you keep the cup straight, it will get filled up with water. If not in the first shower, in the second shower. Mm. But if you keep the cup upside down, no matter how much it rains, it never gets filled up. Our attention is like the cup. When our attention is toward receiving grace, it gets filled up. By marking a particular day to be a day of abundance, we create the anticipation in all the seekers to put their attention to receiving that grace. And therefore, on a day like that, like Bandara Day, the grace fills up our cups and we feel it. And you will all feel it. Many of you have come to this Bandara before and you know how wonderful an experience we have with the cup being filled up with grace, our cup of attention, which we are able to hold towards that grace. Otherwise, in our daily lives, we have put our cups in the wrong direction. We put our cups in the direction of worldly activities, of mundane things happening around us, of the physical matters that are around us. And we have very little time, very little attention to give to the area from where the grace is flowing. The grace flows from within ourselves. The Master's grace is always coming to us from within ourselves. And we don't put our attention towards within ourselves, we are constantly putting our attention on things outside of ourselves. And that is why we miss so much of the grace that's flowing. By marking a special day, of course, we concentrate our attention on that grace and we receive more and more of it. Actually, if we learn this lesson that the grace is not flowing because of 2nd of April, it's, it's filling our cup because we have put more attention on it. We have put more attention on the area which needs attention, which is our own self, our own consciousness, which is in fact the house of the Master. The Master does not live outside anywhere. Our perfect living Masters reside in our own consciousness inside ourselves. And therefore, when we put the attention on ourselves through a meditational program like this, we get filled up with grace. If we learn this lesson, we can make every day of the year a Bandara day. We can celebrate Bandara every, year, every day of the year. But since we are all occupied so much with external things, we are occupied so much, our mind is totally committed to do things outside, we don't get the kind of opportunity that we can get by earmarking a certain time for this. That's the significance of this day. For me, personally, it's the most important day of the year. 
The reason being that I saw great master himself. Hazur Maharaj Baba Sawal Singh, the great master, he used to celebrate this day on the 29th of December. His master passed away on that day. And people wondered, what is he celebrating? Is he celebrating the death of somebody? Do we find abundance in somebody dying and then using the anniversary of the death for celebration? That would make sense. But he was not celebrating the death of his master. He was celebrating that he has to no longer depend upon the physical presence of the master to be in touch with him every day, every moment. That when the physical body is not available, you cannot see the physical form of a master. That's the best motivation to go and see the astral radiant form of the master, which is always within us. So one of the big motivations for this day is that we are able to manifest the radiant form of the Master within ourselves. And that is why on the 29th of December, every year, the Great Master would hold a satsang and he would have a nice food also, so people could see the abundance of food. We had more chapatis to eat that day than most of the days. We had better quality of dal and also we had a dessert on that day. But that was outside. Inside, he gave us so much attention, which helped us to manifest his radiant form within ourselves. This is a great opportunity. I saw great master using this day, the Bandara day, to go into a little small room in the center of his house, which was built in the Dera. <clears throat> that was a little room which was existing even when there was no other house around it. And that is where great master got initiated from his master, Baba Jamal Singh, and he would go there. At least two or three times I went with him. He took me along just to show how he spends the morning on the day of Bandara. And I have never seen great master shed tears of joy and rejoicing as I used to see on the 29th of December every year. Therefore, that so much of his emotions could well up, that so much of his feelings could be so visible to an outsider like me. It touched me very deeply. It still touches me today. Therefore, if he had that kind of feeling about the Bandara day, the day when his master was no longer tied down to a physical appearance, but was available in his more real form, as a radiant form of the master for his disciples, it was a day of great celebration. And I still believe that tomorrow is a great day of celebration. And I can tell you that we have been having this Bandara celebration for so many years. And I actually have an experience of master coming, great master coming and blessing people who are assembled here in a manner, in an explicit, physical, visible manner and never seen other days. So for all of us, it's a great day and you will experience that tomorrow. Only keep the cup in the right direction. Keep the attention towards receiving the grace that will flow tomorrow. Today, I think Connie has asked me to talk on a difficult subject. When I talk here, nobody ever consults me what subject you want to talk on. They know that whatever subject they set, I will start a few words on that, go around about and say what I have to say, and end by a conclusion on what they set up as my subject. Therefore, they try. And this has been going on for years now. It started when I first came to work in this country and I worked with two black friends of mine and they tested me. They were testing me out whether I really knew anything about this spiritual path or it was just guesswork I was making. So they would put difficult uh, topics and uh, without consulting me and ask me to speak and record it immediately. So I found this way, easy way Okay, start with the subject that they have given and then go round to the main subject which is that the truth lies within you. All masters have said that, go within and find the truth. If you want more details of that, I can give you more. But the subject is very simple. The real truth lies within ourselves. What else do we want to know? The kingdom of the creator is inside us. What else do we want to know? We just have to go inside and find it. How to go inside? Well, that can take time to explain. But the subject matter is very simple. 
So when they would set up difficult subjects, it became easier for me to switch from there to the real subject. Today, Connie has asked me to speak on a subject which looks like a contradiction. The subject for the talk this evening is the sound of silence. Now, does it look like a contradiction that you should have sound, you should also have silence? Silence is supposed to be the opposite of any sound. But I know that this subject has been dealt with by so many mystics before. Longinus, the Greek poet, wrote about the eloquence of silence. He wrote a beautiful poem on the wonderful eloquence that silence can produce which words cannot produce. I remember I had a friend studying with me in college and he had a beautiful, handsome face, great personality, but when he spoke, he looked like an idiot. <laughs> I told him, if you want to succeed in life, just keep quiet. <laughs> You will get anything you want. <laughs> that was a practice of silence. <laughs> but coming to the current topic of the spiritual significance of these words, a Persian mystic says, Khamosh Panjanobat Vishnos Asamani. It's only by keeping quiet and silent that you can hear the five melodies in the sky. It's a very powerful statement. You have to be quiet, silent, in order to hear the five melodies ringing in the skies. Now, there is a contradiction that on the one hand you are quiet and then you can also hear sounds, but that kind of sound he's talking of is the sound that creates our entire experience. Those five sounds are generating the levels of consciousness which create all the regions of astral, causal, spiritual nature. These sounds are not merely sounds to be heard. These are sounds that are like living entities. So he is referring to something much deeper than merely physical sounds. In one of the seminars I attended uh, with a spiritual group, one of the men had, had come from Japan and Harishimoto, Harishimoto, some name like that, and he was practicing silence and quiet. He wanted to find which is the place where you can get complete silence. So he was searching all over and he couldn't find any place which was completely silent. There's some kind of noise everywhere. So he, in Japan, in his own ashram, he built up the soundproof chamber. He invited me to see that. I went and saw the soundproof chamber in which all sound was locked. But when you went inside that chamber, the sound that you never hear, like the sound of your heartbeat, became so loud. The sound of your breathing, the sound of the blood flowing in your vessels can all be heard if everything is completely quiet. He couldn't imagine that there is so much sound. Of course, there are many other kinds of sounds in the belly and so on. Leaving that aside, even in a complete quiet atmosphere, he found there was no place which was completely quiet. So what do these mystics mean? When they say, if you are quiet and there's complete silence, you can hear the five melodies. They are not really talking of this silence at all. They are talking of the silence of the mind. Because the mind is never silent. As you might have noticed in your own lives, mm -hmm. that the mind keeps talking all the time. You can try to put the mind to sleep, it doesn't sleep. You can go to sleep, the body can go to sleep, the mind will keep on talking, create dream sequences for you. In one of the studies that I did when I first came to this country, I found every person, every night, dreams. They don't remember their dreams, so they think they don't dream. And those dreams are connected with the thought process. And they have been able to wake up people in deep slumber and record what they had to say. They were thinking and creating dreams at all times. We dream several times Sequential dreams several times, every night. You don't remember that. But the mind never stops thinking. What the mystic says, that you have to stop the babble of this mind that is drawing your attention. And that is why you don't hear the mystical sounds that are there. To hear the sounds of the mystic knowledge, enlightened sounds, a sound that can lead to enlightenment. If you want to hear that, you have to keep your mind quiet. Not that you just keep your mouth shut. The old swamis in India, a group of swamis, believed that if you could keep your mouth shut, 
for a certain time, you could get enlightened. So they found a way of keeping their mouth shut. It was called Maun Varat. That means fasting from speech. That means no speaking. Some of them taped themselves, put an actual adhesive tape, so even by accident, no voice would come out. But then, to communicate with people, they would write notes on the piece of paper. Mm -hmm. I can't speak today, or what about bringing my coffee for me today? <laughs> well, how is it different from speaking from your mouth? Therefore, they were not really quiet at all. They never got any enlightenment. They only thought they had performed a nice ritual of keeping quiet. So therefore, when the mystics say, keep quiet, they are referring to the silence of the mind. That if your mind is quiet, you can hear the five melodies that are generating the five levels of experience. The physical experience you are experiencing here, the astral experience, which is only based upon your sense perceptions without physical matter. The causal experience, which your mind can experience with no senses required and no physical matter required. The spiritual experience where there is no mind, no matter, and the ultimate total experience where you find this whole one consciousness that is the creator of all these levels. This can be found if we can keep our mind quiet. Can we keep our mind quiet? I guess no, it's not easy. There was a friend of mine studying in the university at Harvard, Harvard University in Cambridge. When I came here, he was also interested in the spiritual path. And we used to compare notes. And he said that he has to find a way to keep the mind quiet. If the mind can stop thinking, it will be very easy to get enlightened. He, he believed that. And so many mystics have said that if your mind can be quiet, if you can still your mind, that will make it quiet and does not bother you. Then you can get enlightened. So he tried many experiments and one morning I got a phone call from him. And he said, Eureka, I found the way. I found how I can stop thinking. Just quiet the mind. I said, congratulations. I am very happy. You are the first person I have ever met in life who can do that. I would like you to come to my apartment and give me a little demonstration. If you can really stop thinking, I think you have found a very great shortcut to spiritual enlightenment. And I would like to learn it myself. So he came over to my apartment and he said, I can, by a yogic exercise, by control of breathing, I can stop my mind from thinking. I can divert the entire attention into my yogic posture, into my asana, into my breathing technology, and therefore I can pull out of thinking. I said, how long can you stop thinking? He says, well, at least half an hour. I said, that's great. I would be very happy if you can stop thinking for one minute. If somebody can do it for one minute, he can surely do it for half an hour or whatever. If you can achieve this wonderful goal of stopping your mind from thinking for one minute, you can do it forever. So let's try for one minute. You sit down, get into your asana, get into your breath work that you want to do, and I will give you a signal to stop thinking. And the signal will be a little clap, just like that. When I do like this, stop thinking. And I'll keep my eye on my stopwatch for 60 seconds. After 60 seconds, I will do this again. You can start thinking again. And then we will review what happens to a human being in that posture with that breath work when he's not thinking at all. He agreed to do that. And he got into his yogic position. He assumed a very difficult posture, which it's hard for me to do, in spite of the, all the yoga I learned, which I do. But anyway, I said, there's a good method to stop thinking. So let him try it out. And when he was all set, and I saw he was ready, I gave him the clap. There he was watching. I didn't know what was going on with him. I was looking at the watch. 60 seconds passed. Here's the second signal. Come on, now you can think. Did you stop thinking for those 60 seconds? He said, yes, I did. I said, let's review what actually happened. Don't make any stories. Recall what happened. Because I want to know exactly what happens to consciousness of a human being who is not thinking. What does consciousness do at that time? So I said, just recall what actually happened. It just happened a few minutes ago. 
tell me exactly when I did the first clap, what happened? How did you know you have to stop thinking? He said, when you did the clap, I said to myself, now I have to stop thinking. I said, that's a thought. You intruded into that 60 second space. He said, just took me two, three minutes. Two, three seconds. Two, three seconds only. I said, okay, let's take it that the experiment was not for 60 seconds, only 57 seconds. You spent three seconds in saying to yourself, let me stop thinking. I said, then how did you know if that stage had occurred, how did you know that when I put the second clap, you can start thinking again? You could have blocked yourself completely forever. He said, now I recall that after I said, now I have to stop thinking, I did go on to say, and I will not think anymore till he claps again. You extended the time further now. <laughs> and I said, after that happened, did you at any time thereafter remember that you have to hear for the second clap? And he began to remember more and more. <laughs> and as we discussed in the next 10 minutes, he said, oh my God, I was thinking more in this 60 seconds than ever before. <laughs> And yet he thought that he was not thinking. Imagine what kind of game the mind can play. That the mind can go into another wavelength, go into another frequency and make you believe that just because you're not thinking in that local frequency, you stop thinking. You will notice if you have a thought, I supposing I tell you, make this statement, I love God. It's a simple statement of a religious nature. I love God and keep on repeating it and see if this is the only thing your head is saying or you are saying something else. And when you start saying, I love God, some other voice is saying, no, that's too fast. No. You are commenting upon what you are saying. If you really carefully see, your mind does not think in one channel. It does not think in one level. It thinks in several levels. And one level, that is what problem people have when they are doing their similar, the repetition of holy words. They repeat the words and constantly the mind is thinking something else at the same time. And if they control both the levels, a third level comes up. Supposing the third level is controlled, another face appears, a friend's face who starts talking to you without your realizing that's your mind talking also. Mind never stops it. After that event and after so many other events, I've come to the conclusion the mind never stops thinking. And I came to a very good conclusion that the mind cannot stop thinking because that's the, that is the uh, function of the mind to stay alive. If the mind stops thinking, it will die. Just like if the, if the heart stops beating, you die. If the brain stops working, you die. If the physical things, any of these essential functions stop, you die. The mind's essential function, perhaps the most important function, is to think. If the mind stops thinking, it's dead. If the mind dies, the astral body, the sensory systems, and the physical body dies with it. You can't survive. How can you stop the mind from thinking? If that's the very, very basis on which the mind is alive. Therefore, nobody can stop thinking. What do the mystics mean by saying, keep your mind quiet? What they mean is something very different. What they mean is, move yourself away from where the mind is thinking. Ignore the mind. Ignore the thought. That's possible. Because like Buddha said to his students once, he said, you will notice if you want to study your own mind, that there are really two minds. There's a mind that's engaged in change. A mind that is constantly looking for change and commenting upon the change which is a universal thing that happens outside your life. Whenever you're looking outside, things are changing, and you're commenting about the change, and that outer mind is constantly engaged in talking about the change. But the other inner mind, that does not involve itself in that conversation at all. It sits there and listens to what the outer mind is doing. So there is inside our consciousness two kinds of minds. The mind that speaks and chatters, and the mind that listens. If you confine yourself to the mind that listens and not to the mind that speaks, you'll be able to attain enlightenment. 
switch over you are ignoring the mind that speaks of course he was talking of two minds the mind that speaks and the mind that listens later mystics changed it to distinguish why are we calling both of them mind and they introduced the nomenclature which had existed in ancient ancient indian text separating the two from atma which was supposed to be inner mind to mana which was the outer mind translated it would mean the soul and the mind the soul is the listener and the mind is the speaker we all have this experience the soul never speaks the soul always listens the mind always speaks the mind never listens the two functions are so well divided in our consciousness that if we just contemplate in meditation who is the speaker and who is the listener you will find that your inner consciousness the fact that you are conscious makes you the listener the fact that you have a mind that thinks makes you the speaker if you did not have something like a mind that can speak you would have no means of communicating you communicate through the mind this distinction was so sharp in the old text that we studied and the old mystic practice that they said instead of putting your attention on the speaker in your head put your attention on the listener they said the art of good meditation is listening not speaking if you are chanting all the time without listening to what you are chanting it has no effect on enlightenment but if you are listening to what you are chanting and separate yourself from the chanter and you are just the listener and not the chanter you get enlightened it's a very simple thing you will notice that all the mystics who have always advocated that you can find the truth within yourself are referring to the listener within yourself they telling if you become a listener and not a speaker you can get enlightened the simple way now when you become a listener you are quiet you are not speaking so you give up the speaking to another part of yourself an accessory to yourself the mind is not an essential part of the self the mind is an accessory it's added on to the self the self is pure consciousness the ability to be conscious to have the ability to be aware the ability to be conscious you don't need to speak you don't need to make a sound you only need to have the ability to listen therefore if we are putting our attention all our attention on being the listener we become enlightened and we are quiet we are ignoring the speaker and therefore we have a real silence around us it's only when we are able to ignore the mind leave aside what the mind is doing mind will keep on thinking don't think that you have to control thinking of the mind the mind thinks the trouble arises that we it draws us draws our attention to that thinking if we don't put our attention on what the mind is thinking we are quiet and there is no problem at all the the thoughts that the mind generates based upon experiences of the past experiences that are happening right around us as have happened for millions of years around us as you might know if you have studied the age of the body the age of the sensory system and the age of the mind that we call carry if you have any inkling of how old these are they are not the same age we might think that the mind is function of the brain and is born along with this body the embryo and the fetus creates the brain but the brain is doing things the mind inside the brain is doing things which cannot be explained it can go back into history can recall things that were there prior to its embryonic stage therefore it's very difficult to believe that the mind is merely a function of the physical brain if the mind is not part of the physical brain and has its own existence how old is it according to the law of karma which is so important a part of indian philosophy and our western philosophy too because it's a very good law of explanations everything can be explained good things have happened good karma bad things have happened bad karma you are doing something uh, good to people you are creating good karma you are doing bad to bad things evil things you are creating bad karma karma explains almost everything so this law of karma is dependent 
so much on the function of the mind. You cannot do good or bad if the mind is not involved. <coughs> Who determines what is good or bad? What is conscience? Where does conscience reside? The conscience that's the gatekeeper and says this was good, this was bad. Where does that function? It functions in our mind. So therefore, the mind has a lot of other things to do. The law of karma says that the karma is all carried on the mind from lifetime after lifetime, which means we have the same mind, one life after We never change our mind. In that sense, women change their mind, but that's a def different way. The mind remains the same. The sensory perceptions, which are also independent of our physical body. We sometimes think that we have sense perceptions because of the nervous system. The optic nerve looks at things, carries it to the brain, and therefore we see. Auditory nerve carries sound. All the nerves, tactile nerves, they carry their messages, and that all the nervous system is built into the physical body. All the stimuli that the body gets is transmitted to the brain. If this were so, nobody could have such monstrous dreams and see them. Where do you see them from? How could you see dreams? How could you see things in imagination? How could you close your eyes and imagine anything and it becomes visible? Are we talking of the eyes and the optic nerve and are we talking of the retina? It doesn't exist there. Therefore, seeing, touching, tasting, these sense perceptions have independent existence. Only those who have done meditation up to a point where they can become unconscious of the physical body. Virtually die in their physical body and still remain alive in consciousness. Only those people know that the sense perceptions have existed prior to the birth of the body and continue to exist even after you die. That the perceptions of the senses is independent of the perception that we associate with this body. That the body sense organs are not creating the sense perceptions they are only blocking some of the sense perceptions which could arise if we were merely imaginary bodies. Imagine if you are just imaginary bodies. With imagination, you could create all perceptions. Where does that come from? So these mystics who have actually meditated and gone to the state where they can close down the experience of one layer of their own self, like the physical layer, they shut that down by withdrawing the attention to a point inside themselves where the physical body disappears for them. At that time, they find they have another body with all the sense perceptions intact. So sense perceptions are not arising from this body, but from that which is intact already inside us. They go further and they can actually die in the sense perception body, which we call astral body for short. Astral body can die and you still have the same mind and the same karma. The karma goes on from lifetime after life. These people who have done this work have estimated that the life of the physical body could be anything on an average of a hundred years for a long period of evolution. That the average life of the astral body, the sensory body, is about a thousand physical years. Some are three thousand years. Some are eight hundred years. That the average life of the human mind is about three million years. That you take three million years before you are reborn with a new mind. Which means that in one lifetime of one single mind of a person, one can be reborn several thousand times in this physical universe and carry the same karma over and over again for the whole cycle. If you look at these numbers, you marvel what kind of space are we living in that we have identified ourselves only with the outer cover, totally forgetting what is inside us. Through meditation, at least we can do one thing, that we can concentrate our attention, concentrate our attention away from things that we don't want to put attention on, like a physical body, and put it on something that is within this body. If we can do that, it's a simple exercise, may take some patience and some doing, but at least you can find out what form you exist in if you didn't have the physical body. How long have you lived? How long is your memory in that form? Can you remember things that happened 200 years ago? If you can, surely this is not yourself. It's something longer lasting than this body. If you can go deeper, further and go into your causal self, which is your own mind, and find that you can recall things that happened a million years ago. You can recall things that happened on the physical plane, on the astral plane a million years ago. Your life is not confined to this physical body. If you look at this experience that can come through meditation, you will find that we have been creating our problems 
just by misidentifying our own self with the covers upon ourselves. Putting our attention on the physical body and thinking, this is me, this is the self. We shut out our own past, we shut out our own reality, and we start experiencing the limited experience of the physical body as our experience. We don't even call it the experience of the body. We call it our own experience by misidentification. When we misidentify with the sensory perceptions that there's our perception that ourselves. We miss a big point that we are lying within those perceptions. They are merely a cover, a method to use for communication, for getting input from a created world and to react with the created world. So we are creating problems for ourselves. A new book has just been released. I just read a little about it. It's called the 90-10 Principle. Any, anybody heard of it? The 90-10 Principle states that only 10% of things that happen in our life are predestined. The 90% we create by reacting to that 10%. I'll give you an example. Supposing a man is ready to go to office at breakfast and the little child sitting on the table at breakfast spills the coffee and falls on his new shirt which he has worn to go to attend a meeting. What will the man do? He'll curse. He'll be scolding the child. He shouldn't have done it. The child starts crying. He goes and tries to change his shirt and run to office. But then the child, by crying, and missed the bus to school. So he has to... Is that you? <laughs> so the child is crying and missed the bus to school. And then there are two speakers here. In the <laughs> One is my mind and there's another mind here. <laughs> The story goes on that when we react like that in an angry way and we say, okay, I'll take you in my car. And you miss the bus, you take in the car and the, you try to reach quickly and the cop gives you a ticket for speeding. Too bad. Now I get late for my office too. You reach late for your office and you realize you forgot your briefcase at home. The whole day goes so bad. Now the reaction is to a co cup of coffee spilling on you. You could have reacted differently and said, child, don't worry. These things happen. It's just an accident. Just be more careful in future. Child would have caught the bus in time. Take your briefcase, gone to all. This is an example given in the book. That 90% of our life is reacting to things which only take 10% of our life. The point the book is making is that we are creating these problems for ourselves by reacting differently. Supposing you are a spiritual seeker, supposing you are a disciple of a perfecting master, it's all a setup. Treat it like that you will see that your reactions will be totally different from what they are today. You won't get involved in things and won't react the way you do. You take it as a show, set up, you understand why it's taking place. What happened? What's behind the scene? Why is this scene taking place? And you'll be curious to know more. You'll go within yourself to the director's table and say, now what next are you going to do? You'll find out more about the show and enjoy it. Here we are willing to spend Seven dollars, ten dollars to go and see a movie. And things happen on the screen. And nobody jumps on the seat to go and intervene in that. By meditation, we discover that our life is no more than that. It's a play, very often a replay. A replay of something that has been played many times. And we have gone and we have been given the beautiful opportunity to use without any three-dimensional glasses to make it do, as real as possible. We have shut off our own cameras. We shut off the projectors so that we can think that this is real stuff. We have created virtual reality and we call it reality. The virtual reality that we are looking at should be looked at exactly like we would see a virtual reality movie. It's a three-dimensional movie going on. And we don't have to jump out from our seats. There's a difficulty in practicing this. Whenever I have suggested to people that you would change your life instantly, overnight, if you started looking upon life as a show taking place on the stage. The difficulty is that they begin to think that the, their own body is the viewer of the show and everybody else is the show. It doesn't work like that. You have to remember that your body is a character in the show. Your body, what you think is yourself, is also one character in the show and participating. You have to sit somewhere else to watch the show. The place to watch the show 
is behind the eyes inside. Go and pick up a good chair there. Go and pick up a nice seat there. And view life from there. Your life will change. One little thing can make that big difference. If you are able to find the nice vacant chair behind your eyes, inside yourself, then open your eyes and look at the character in which you have taken a seat and the other characters around you and how it's going on. You can watch the show very differently than the getting involved and tearing up the screen because you don't like the movie. That's what we try to do here. These are things that can be learned through meditation. I am hoping that while we celebrate the Bandara tomorrow, we should also have some sessions of meditation in the middle. Because after all, the talk does not lead to any results. This is the subject of spiritual path is a practical subject of doing, not of merely talking and listening. Because even if we go and listen to thousands of lectures, when we come back to the what we call the real world, those lectures go from one ear and go from the other and we forget all about it. That's why we have to practice something by which we get used to having another perspective, another way, another point of view from which to look at this creation, look at this life, and also see who is the creator behind this. We blame the creator all the time. We blame everything. God, how did you do this to me? And as if there is some separate entity sitting outside. And when you go into meditation, deeper meditation, you realize that the closer you go to the creator, ultimately you find you are the part of that all the time. That in your totality, you are the creator. There is nothing outside of you. This whole show has taken place within consciousness. Everything outside, which looks like outside, time, space and so on, has been created from there. And it is looking like it's outside. It's a projection. But how can you know these things? We are so used to, accustomed to thinking an outside world to be the reality. Only when we die and it shrinks and we find it all disappearing in front of us, we realize maybe we were creating all this. Otherwise, you don't know it. Why wait till you die and then find out how this was created? Why don't we follow a simple method which is called dying while living? That means have the same experience while you are alive to be able to see it beforehand. And dying while living is one of the methods they teach in good meditation. That you should be able to have the same experience on the physical body of the withdrawal of consciousness from the extremities of the body to the brain, to the position behind the eyes, from where your attention is flowing in the wakeful state. If you can withdraw your attention to that point, the experience of withdrawal of attention is the same as the experience of actual physical death. Why not have it without dying? And then you are able to know exactly what death is. Know exactly death never kills you. It only kills the body. Death never kills even the astral body, which moves from one form to another form. All these things can be discovered within yourself. You don't have to rely on somebody else for these experiences. According to great master, we should believe nothing except what we experience. He said on the spiritual path, just because somebody says something and we say we believe it, is blind faith. He was totally against blind faith. I am more totally against blind faith because I could not have blind faith myself. I rebelled against any concept that... If somebody says something, just believe it because somebody has said it. Where's the proof? There is no better proof than your own experience. Therefore, whenever you hear all these discourses, whenever you hear things about spiritual path, see how much of it is verifiable with your own experience. And if you have questions about that, that I want to have a verification of this thing, I am stuck somewhere. Ask questions. Get help. Get help how to verify these so-called spiritual experiences described by others. Books are full of them. Discourses are full of them. Are you full of them? Unless you are yourself full of them, you don't believe anything. Great Master quoted another mystic who said, Do not believe even the word of your Master if you cannot verify with your own experience. If you cannot see with your own inner eyes, take it all. It's just a theory. Don't reject it. Wait till you can verify it. That is why this teaching that I refer to as great master teaching is based entirely on experience. It's an experiential 
path. It's not a path to create blind faith. It's to create living faith. Living faith is different from blind faith. Like all living things, it grows. All living things grow. This faith grows every day when new things happen in an external life. And the same things are happening internally with me. And they match what we call the great coincidences of life. When you watch them every day, this is a little miracle. This couldn't have been anywhere else. And those things support every one of these things that you have learned. And every day you see more and more of these miraculous happenings, strange coincidences happening. Your faith is being built up. That's like a living faith. But if you just say somebody made a statement and I'm sticking to that, that's blind faith. So remember, great master teaching emphasizes it should be experiential and should be real. So to come back, as I said in the beginning, to the subject that has been laid down for me. <laughs> be a listener and you will experience the sound of silence. Be a listener. <clears throat> Detach your attention from the speaking mind and put your attention on the listening soul. And you will find that all the five levels of creation that have been placed into us and known to us, known to mankind, can be traversed by all of you, any one of you. The five levels where you experience creation, the physical level where the material creation is taking place with atoms and molecules outside. <coughs> the astral experience, which is purely based on sensory perceptions from which all imagination arises, all ideas arise. But Socrates called the world of ideas. The totally mental stage where the mind needs no props of separate sense perceptions in order to have experience. Their concepts grow. Their concepts are converted through ideas to have that experience. To go into true spirituality where you discover that you never needed a mind to be alive. That you are far more alive without the companionship of the mind than you think you are with a babbling mind. Then the final stage when you can go to the spiritual to totality where you find that the whole show took place in one consciousness and that one consciousness is the ultimate reality and we given it different names. You can give it any name of any creator that was the ultimate reality. All this lies within each one of us sitting here. All this is accessible while we are human beings. It's not accessible in any other form unfortunately. You can have many forms. Life forms, life can be in plant life. The plants live pre-programmed their DNA states exactly what they have to do. They go through it, they perish. Other insects, birds, mammals, they all perish after going through the instinctive performance of their role in the karmic pattern handed down to them. They have no choice. They don't deliberate. They don't say, should I or should I not? None of them. Only a human being does this. Only a human being has choices. The experience, a genuine experience of free will. A human being makes decisions. Should I do it or not? Do it. And this experience of free will is so strong in a human being that it binds him down to doing wrong things and right things and get trapped in karma. It frees him to be a seeker of the truth beyond karma and take him back to the place which is beyond the mind. It's the same free will that helps both ways. Tying you up or taking you out. So therefore, we can use the free will to be a seeker. You can't seek if you have no free will. And this is a special gift only to human beings. It is not even a gift enjoyed by the gods and the angels. Not even the guardian angels have that because they know already what's going to happen. There's no choice. If a human being came to know exactly what's going to happen the rest of his life, exactly what's going to happen the next minute, he'll lose all free will. And will be no longer a candidate for the spiritual path. Can you imagine? Ignorance is truly a bliss in this case. That just because we don't know what's going to come in the future makes us qualified. To be spiritual candidates and spiritual disciples. So this is a great gift given to us. Human beings have this unique ability to seek and to find. Therefore, let's take full advantage. Let's use this bandhara to get the abundance of grace that we are going to get. Let's learn how to be listeners and ignore our mind and thereby prove that there is a much more valuable sound 
in silence. Thank you very much. You can clap. I have a little footnote. The lecture is over. <laughs> the footnote is that uh, I was very blessed to be initiated by the great master, Hazur Baba Sawal Singh. And very often, when we gather like this, it reminds me of the satsangs and the discourses that we attended there. And I know that he emphasized the importance of seva, service. In fact, he said, if meditation is too hard for you, try to make up for that by doing more seva. And he, the reasoning for intellectual mind was that when you do service, you really are trying to deflate part of your ego if you do without any regard for reward. If you're just going to be doing seva. One of the sevas that became popular in the great master's time was called Mitti Seva, which means working on the land in the Dera. And since dirt was picked up to fill up the ravines around the Dera and more construction could be taken place, it's called the Dirt Seva, but translated as Mitti Seva. Seva is an Indian word, Mitti is an Indian word, it meant that you work on the land. And there, the advantage was that you could have rulers, princes, billionaire businessmen, poor poor people from the lowest class, untouchables, all working together. Nobody knew who was rich, who was poor. That's quite an experience if you are sensitive in your ego. If your ego is hurt very quickly, why, why should I do this? It's a very, very good method of tackling part of the ego. And I used to love that. We all used to try and get some time to do that seva. The other seva was simple. We could all donate money. We could donate goods. People brought rice. They brought wheat to cook in the langar, in the common kitchen. They uh, wrote, uh, gave some money to buy things that were not uh, available in kind, cash. So the <coughs> money seva and the seva with food and ingredients they brought and the mitti seva all these were encouraged by the great master. He, of course, encouraged the highest seva, he said, is the seva with the mind. And therefore, there was always a meditation session. Whenever we had a bandhara, whenever we had satsangs, we had meditation session. It appears to me that I, while I am alive, would like to see that enacted in this country. Because great master said that the axis of spirituality, he said this more than 60 years ago. He said the axis of spirituality will shift to the West. And now these are translating his exact words. He said that India and the East has been the seat of a lot of spiritual uh, presence. A lot of mystics have been born there, have taught there, and people have carried the message of spirituality from the East. But time is coming when it will shift, the whole axis will shift. And the countries that are trying to make more money, great affluence, will get tired of that and look for spiritual things. And we, who have been satisfied with spirituality, will start making more money, build more factories, and so on. He was quoting particularly the experience of China and India and those countries. And I saw this was happening, beginning to happen. Even while he was alive, it was beginning to happen. And he began to get disciples from the United States and from England, from other places in the West. But he specifically said that the axis of spirituality will shift and go to the West and localize itself in a big way in the United States of America. Do you know that those words of his, which I heard as a child, have been ringing in my ears when I got the first opportunity to come and move into the United States. I took it to get a ringside seat on the big show that is going to happen here. That's why I was here. That this is, and now I see it's happening. I see the great master's words coming true. So, I, having come from the East, having come from India, having seen, remembered those nostalgic days of how we did Seva there, I thought I might share with you also that experience by creating a little environment temporarily for that. Therefore, I said, to the organizers of this Bandara, 
that let's have a meditation session introduced in the Bandara day. We should have meditation tomorrow. Let's have following the Bandara at least a little time set apart for a physical seva of that kind which we did. Let's work on land. Then I found out that the organization that arranges this has 10 or 15 acres of land that it owns not too far away from here in Bruce. And I remember at one time I had suggested this very thing earlier and many of us all ran and worked on a, on a parking lot where we used to park the cars and we were working on the land and everybody felt so happy. And I also tried to pick up a little handkerchief of mine and said, I am also doing work. <laughs> but that's beside the point. So I was thinking we might do something uh, before we go back, if we can stay on. Some of us can at least start this tradition. If, if any of you are here who remember when we worked on the land last time, please raise your hands. Oh, lots of people are there. Did you all enjoy it? Should we have it again? No, very good. I've got the yes. So from those people who came last time, how many of you who are new and have never seen that happen would like to do a thing like that? Oh, very good. Thank you. So we'll make it a, a tradition, at least on Bandara Day and on the and the meditation workshops we have here. We should be able to do some of that. So we have experienced that service for people, even service in the kitchen, making food, washing dishes. I remember how much I used to enjoy washing the dishes in the langar in the dera. I and or a, some personal kind of seva that we used to get. I remember you know, uh, getting an early start on using a big fan because there was no electric power there. So in the hot weather when the great master gave a discourse, somebody had to use a big fan behind him and move the fan like this. And I said, can I do it? Because you're too small. I said, no, no, I can try. Actually, the fan was bigger than me. <laughs> I as a child, was using, I still remember. The beauty of that experience that this is serving, that was serving the master. And then I could serve the people. I did Mithi Seva. A, a satsangar was built up there, where the great master in, initially started giving his discourses, and then later on used part of that building for initiations. And I remember we carried bricks to build up that place. And I was still young. I used to carry one brick on my head. <laughs> Other people carried a basket of bricks. And there used to be an intoxicated man. And we called him a Mastana. Because he was, he had so many experiences. And while he was walking, he would talk about his experiences. And I shared those walks with him while doing the seva of the brick, brick seva. So I carry one brick, that's good enough for me. He carried a big basket. And he would tell me stories of whatever he would experience and look, he said, look, you know, you've been very close to the master. He's just uh, initiated you. And do you know, you'll have to learn a new language. I said, what does that mean? He said, although when we go to the astral plane, we find we have been there before. But mm. we have been out from there for so long and lived in birth after birth in another area of the physical universe. When we go there, we've even forgotten the language that he used to speak. And we virtually relearn our own language. Now, words like that meant so much for me. Because he was talking from an experience. He was talking from something that made sense. So, I used to love carrying the brick to hear his talk also. This little discourse that he used to give. I want that some of you who have the time get those experiences over here. And I feel very nostalgic that this is something that I saw in the Dera. And Great Master was right that not only the spirit of this spiritual path has moved over to the West and come to this country, but some of the traditions that hold on the methods by which our ego is affected can be actually experienced by people here. There was a colonel in the Air Force, U.S. Air Force, who came to India for the first time to the Dera, and there he had a bag with him, and he saw people carrying loads of dirt. And he asked one of the guys, can you come and help me with the bag? I said, sure, sir. He said, you speak good English. He said, yes, I learned some English. 
So the man carried his bag to the guest house, which had been arranged for this visitor from the United States. And as he laid down the bag in the room, he offered him a dollar tip. <coughs> Say, here's a dollar. This is American money. It's much more than your Indian rupee, he told him. He said, I am very happy to see this American money. They don't take any tips. No, no, take it. It's good. You can buy it. Change it for rupees. No, I don't want it. So in the evening, there was a meeting. And in the meeting, he saw that same man dressed up in a suit. And sitting there, he said, isn't this the same guy who carried my bag in the morning? And they found out he was one of the richest businessmen in the country, mm -hmm. a billionaire mm -hmm. who carried his bag. Mm -hmm. In that Mitti Seva, there was no billionaire, there was no poor man. They were all equal. It was a, it's a beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. such a, that one Seva can create this kind of equality. We realize that this is our karma has made us rich or poor. It's different states have been created for us to live through life. It does not mean that our souls are different. Our souls are the same. Our spirit from which we get the conscious experiences is identical. The listener is the same in each one of us. The speakers are different. So if we get enlightened to know our own self, the listener, you'll find that we are all equal. If that happens, you will love everybody around you. You see, you don't have to try to love people. It comes automatically. So that kind of universal love that flows from you happens automatically by self-realization you are.